Okay. We are back. You watched your videos. You made sure that you paid attention when you did them. Of course, I'm getting some screen glare. No, anyway, there was something on the video that I wanted to make sure you were all clear on for your calculators because it does help a little bit in terms of knowing what's going on with parametrics. So your calculator can do things parametrically. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can put it in the parametric mode and that friends is where we begin. So what you want to do is have your calculator ready and go to the mode. And under mode, there is an option you have probably not played with before. It's the one that starts with function. It says function, parametric, polar, and SEQ. Normally, you wanna be in function mode. Function mode is the traditional x, y, f of x, x is a func y is a function of x, et cetera, et cetera. Parametric is different and polar is different. We will be doing the calculus in this unit of both parametric and polar curves, which you're acquainted with because you've already looked at parametrics. So select parametric, hover over it, press enter. It should now be darkened outline. And if you go to Y equals, it looks very different. For each curve spot, normally we've got Y sub one, Y sub two, Y sub three, Y sub four, et cetera. Now we have x sub 1 t, y sub 1 t, x sub 2 t, y sub 2 t, x sub 3 t, y sub 3 t, all the way down, I think it goes to like eight. That's not important. But here's what is important. In order to graph a curve parametrically, we need an x and a y. That's because your horizontal and vertical position depends on the time. And it's this definition of time that allows parametrics to be functions. Normally, if we graph something like this. By the way, did you see where T came from? T came from hitting the variable button right there. If we were to graph this curve, it wouldn't graph so good, would it? No, because this is not a function in the XY system. I can zoom in a little bit. Look at that. Nifty, huh? Nifty. So if we treat something as for any given time, it has a horizontal and vertical position, we have a function because there's one input time, one output horizontal, one output vertical. And we don't get any of that pesky vertical line test issues that come up. So we're doing the calculus of these things. And we're going to look at not everything we did for x and y, but a lot of what we did for x and y. And the good news is, for the most part, we don't have to learn anything super new. Now, you did have to learn something new for the second derivative. And you have to learn something slightly new for doing arc length. So if I want arc length of a parametric curve, this needs to be a smooth interval. And remember what smooth means. Continuous. And differentiable. Now that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to you because you've been studying calculus for a little while now. So it shouldn't shock you to know that we need a continuous and differentiable interval of function in order to do calculus on it. Like here, I'm integrating and differentiating. That means that this needs to be differentiable. And in order to be differentiable, you better be, you have to be continuous. Okay. So what can we use this kind of stuff for? We can use this kind of stuff for things like this.
a particle moves so that at any time t, where t is bigger than or equal to zero, the position in the xy plane is given by x of t equals t cubed plus 4t squared, y of t equals t to the fourth minus t cubed. And this is going to be the first thing you're going to do today. So we're going to be active. I want you to find the parametric equations that represent the motion of the particle. Use these equations to describe the motion of the particle at t equals 1. I'll be here to answer questions and support you. And the recording will be paused while that happens. So what did you get? Hopefully something. Now, I didn't mention, because I didn't feel like I had to, because it's the same thing we've been talking about for a while with derivatives. But if you take the first derivative of position, you get velocity and velocity describes motion. When it comes to taking the first derivative of position, you could call it x prime of t, which in this case would be 3t squared plus 8t, and a y prime of t, which would be 4t to the third minus 3t to the second. You can also, if you're not feeling x prime and y prime, you're allowed to say dx dt and dy dt. That's also perfectly fine. And just so you're aware, both of those pieces of notation are used. So you need to be familiar with both. I believe the videos you watched primarily used dx dt and dy dt, but that's not all we got. Okay, so we know that velocity, the first derivative of position describes motion. I would like to know what the motion is when t equals one. So I could say x prime of one, that's three plus eight, which is 11. I'm gonna mix it up and say dy dt when t is one instead of saying y prime of one, they're the same thing. Four minus three is one. So the velocity for x is 11. The velocity for y is one. What does that mean? Well, think about what x is. X is the horizontal axis. So if x is the horizontal axis, how's the particle moving horizontally? We don't have units on here, right? Okay, I'll just be lame and say centimeters per second. Okay, so that's the horizontal handled. How about the vertical, the dy dt? Well, you move up and down vertically, right? Since that value is positive, we're moving up. If you have questions for me, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'm going to go into part B here. Okay, part B asks for the speed of the particle. So this is kind of confusing, isn't it? What have we done in the past? In the past, we get the velocity. Take the absolute value. All right, that's what we do. So we'd get the derivative of position 
or use the velocity function, whatever it is we'd have, we'd get that value. Let's say it was negative 32 centimeters per second. And we'd say, oh, speed is 32 centimeters per second. We take the velocity function or the first derivative position, we'd get our velocity value that was say, I don't know, 17 centimeters per second. Take the absolute value of that, we get 17 centimeters per second. Piece of cake. We have two velocities. Did you notice that? We have two velocities. Also, I didn't specify a time here. Should do that. How are you going to find one speed from two velocities? Are you going to like average them? No, no, we're not going to do anything like that. We're still going to do the absolute value. But this is where math gets really, really interesting, I think. Absolute value in math is more than just make sure the value is positive. I know that's how it's introduced, but absolute value actually does several different things depending on the math you're studying. And the way we're studying math right now is we're interested in magnitude or length. And right there, Understanding that absolute value means magnitude or length tells us exactly what we need to do here. If we read this as speed of a particle parametrically is length of the parametric curve, then we know absolutely what to do. Uh, I just did part D because I'm stupid. I'm going to leave that in there for the video because I embrace my mistakes. So remember the thought about length later. <laughs> All right. So how do you get speed out of two different velocities. That was the part where I was correct up to. We get the speed by not just taking the absolute value, but by doing it <clears throat> in a different way. So absolute value is defined alternately as just make it positive as take the square root of the thing squared. You see this a lot in statistics. It comes up a lot in statistics. So we know we can always make an even number when we're studying series if we have the formula 2n and we're looking at integer values. So it's always going to be even. 2n plus 1 is always going to be odd. Well, another similarly also useful universal math fact is if you square something and then take the square root of it, you always get something positive. You always get, in fact, the positive version of whatever you started with. Because squaring something makes it positive, taking the square root returns it back to its original value. And we know it has to be positive. So this is what we're going to work off of. What we're going to do for speed is take the absolute value of those two values, which in this case is squaring and then square rooting. So if we do this, we are then able to determine the speed, the absolute value 
the magnitude. Okay. Now we have already calculated X prime of one and Y prime of one. It doesn't always work out to our advantage in this fashion, but I thought for expedience sake, which this would have been expedient if I hadn't been, I'm gonna flatter myself and say temporarily an idiot, then we would have been cruising already. So we know X prime of one is 11. And we know Y prime of one is one. So we square both of those and take a square root. Now, something I would like to note is that this question is both, or could be a calculator and it could also be a non-calculator question. So you need to be prepared for those types of things. So if you do non-calculator, you get square root of 122. If you do it with your calculator, you got 0 0.45 centimeters per second. Which brings us to your task. So you're going to work on this one for the next three minutes here. Continuing with the recording, part C. We know that previously we studied the first derivative of position is velocity, which describes motion. The second derivative of position is acceleration, which is also the first derivative of velocity that describes the change in motion. And that means I'm gonna want the second derivative. You could go X double prime or you could use this notation, the second derivative of X. That's 60 plus eight. I would be consistent if I were writing notation. So I would do this for both or this for both. I wouldn't mix it up. I'm mixing it up here again, just because I want to remind you that it is possible. It is possible to do either notation this one is 12t squared minus 6t. If I evaluate the second derivative of x of t at t equals 1, then I have 14. The second derivative of y, y double prime, 12 minus 6, I'm pretty sure is 6. So horizontal is 14 centimeters per second per second. And vertical is six centimeters per second per second. So if you have questions for me, go ahead and type them in chat. Otherwise, we want to move on here to part D, which I apologize, I spoiled some of the, the uh, surprise for my bad on that. So the distance the particle travels from two to five. How are we going to do that? Well, like I said, I already spoiled it a little bit. You may remember this from before when we studied motion. We would integrate speed, which was remember we would do this. And we would do all the fancy schmancy. Okay, it's positive from zero to five, so that's okay. But from five to six, it's negative. So I gotta do that separate. And then seven to eight is positive again. Eight to eight and a half is negative. So I could do that separate. Eight and a half to 10, also negative. So I could do those separate. 
And then I take the absolute value of all those values and add them together. Well, this is where the new thing has an advantage because when we calculate the distance, what we're actually calculating is the arc length. So how far along the path or how far following the motion are we traveling? So dx dt, 3t squared plus 8t, dy dt, 4t cubed minus 3t squared. Both of those quantities are squared. And then we take a square root. Now, I won't say that you always have a calculator. But what I will say is that usually you have a calculator. So there's a few ways you could do this. You could, if you were of a mind, type in the T cubed plus four T squared and the T to the fourth minus t cubed and take the derivatives this way. So it'd be okay. Again, this is if you're in the mode parametric, so that would be fine. Incidentally, what does this look like if we graphed it? I'm curious. Oh, some kind of a line or a curve, not super cool. Anyway. So we could type it in here. You don't have to. You could also, oh, I'm sorry, quick, quick note before I do it, the other thing I'm gonna do. If you wanna get the T, you wanna press the variable button. So the thing you normally press for X, but you don't have to. You can always go to the normal mode and treat this T like X. And I generally don't recommend typing the whole thing in here. I like doing it in pieces because it's easier to check, but I'm going to type it all in because I feel like I need to redeem myself after being a scrub and be extra fancy. And the reason why this also works is because everything here is of one variable. Everything here is T, so I just pretend the T is X. And I type all that stuff in. And I get a pretty big number. But it's only centimeters. So not that big after all. 